Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute, and one of the things we love to do is have good friends come together. Just like Confucius said, there's nothing better than old friends getting together and having a conversation. And that's what we're going to do today. Ken and Lee Scullin have been my friends for a very long time. We're friends not only in the profession that we uh, are involved in, which is the advancing of freedom across the world, but our families have known each other as well, and I just can't tell you how wonderful these people are. Ken Skilland is an, an associate professor in economics at Hawaii Pacific University. Lee Skilland is a freelance educator going all over the world, spreading the message of freedom. We're going to talk today about something fascinating that they started about 10 years ago and just completed the most recent version of it, which is a road show to advance freedom through China and other countries. So please welcome to my program, Ken and Lee Scullin. Ken, welcome to the program. Lee, Thank welcome. You, Thank you yeah. for having me on the well, show. Well, it's so <laughs> great to have both of you here today. And you're fresh off the plane, coming back from a, a rigorous journey. Ken, where, where did you get off, the, where did you go this time? Well, it was the month of July that we went. Uh, Lee organized, uh, spent much of the year organizing a fantastic uh, event all throughout uh, China about eight different uh, cities that we went to uh, talking about free market ideas. That's right. In fact, Lee, maybe you can tell us what cities these are. If we put up the map right now, we can show our viewers exactly where you went. Mm -hmm. So we started in Shenyang, uh, northeast of China, and uh, at the Northeastern University. Then we went to Beijing, the capital of China. Then we went to Chengdu, the capital of Sichuan province, famous for the hot by seafood, and then we went to Dali and Lijiang, that's in Yunnan province. Then we went to Guilin, uh, the beautiful um, city in China. Then we went to Yongzhou, and uh, after that, we ended in Shanghai. That was our tour. Well, that's something. In fact, we've got another slide, number two, in fact, that shows a group of students at a university in China called Northeastern University, I think, in Shenyang. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you're actually teaching them. Well, we're talking about um, free market ideas. We do it in a subtle way that um, often espouses uh, ideas of Friedrich Hayek and Ludwig von Mises uh, about free market ideas. It's an Austrian school of economics that uh, isn't much heard of in many countries of the world, uh, but it is uh, something that we've been having some scholars together, quite a number of scholars who are promoting these ideas. Uh, and we're after we be kind of careful in China because it's, That's right. uh, it's a little difficult to, to be open. But we, for Northeastern University, Lee has had this now 10 years. This is the, uh, the shirts that we're wearing for the 10th anniversary. Uh, and uh, we're, we've actually been invited by the university and uh, the political leadership, the Communist Party leadership there uh, is welcoming us back because they, they appreciate markets and the value that it's brought to China. Just they have to be very, very careful about criticizing uh, the government directly there. Well, you know, Lee, you've seen a lot take place in China over the last several decades. Yes. And a lot, a lot of people are saying it's an open world now. They're open to Western ideas, there's entrepreneurship and so forth, but that's not the whole story, is it? What do you, what do you no. see taking place? No. The only um, Western ideas Chinese government is open to is Marx, Lenin, Stalin, and uh, uh, those four Westerners. And other than th those four Westerners, uh, none of the Western ideas uh, are welcome. What is the level of social control now? Has that been changing in the last few years? Yes. Um, we can say it's the worst in the past 40 years. That's something, that's quite a statement. Uh, and you know, it's a little bit surprising to some of us in the West. I go to conferences where there are people who have been authors and they've traveled the lecture circuit in China and they come back and say, China is so open. They, they roll out the red carpet for me because I'm a, a New York Times best-selling author and people don't realize how free they are. And yet I think, that maybe they're not getting the full picture of what's really taking place. What causes you, Lee, to say that the social control has been actually growing and getting worse? Uh, for example, um, right now, none of uh, uh, the books published in the United States are allowed to be published in China. Well, that's something. 
That's, yeah, zero. That's a historic shift. Yes. And, uh, and uh, uh, today it is announced uh, no new U U.S. agricultural products are allowed to uh, be entered into China. That's, uh, you know, trade uh, sector. Um, other things, for example, no, uh, no Sunday school is allowed in China at churches. No. Um, now that's a real shift because China had been somewhat lenient toward the practice of religion as long as religions didn't become politically active. Are you saying that they're clamping down even more now? It's all changed. Um, the new uh, policy for uh, Christianity is called cling to zero. Mm. Means cling all the churches, uh, non registered churches to zero. And uh, no children under 18 allowed to go to church. And also, they're changing all the textbooks now. Oh, that's something. But let's take a look at a couple of photos and we'll come back and talk mm -hmm. a bit about that. 3.1 and 3.2 we have here. I think these are also uh, in Shenyang. You want to tell us what's going on here, Ken? Well, uh, except for the woman on the far right there who wasn't part of our program, but they. I mean, wasn't one of the scholars teaching there. These are the uh, people who were from all over the world. Uh, uh, Para Bieland, uh, uh, Dean Pong was uh, from China, then Matt, mm -hmm. uh, 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 oh, Matt Dale, Dale. Uh, Dan Mitchell, I don't know if you know, uh, you may have seen him on the news. He's uh, with the Cato Institute, Bharam Mitra from India, uh, Victor Klar from Florida, uh, Kishore Jabalian, from uh, India, uh, from Italy, um, Doug Bandalf, also from the Cato Institute in uh, in Washington D.C., Chris uh, Lingle from uh, Guatemala, then Lee, myself, and Patrick Mardini, the head of the Lebanese Institute for Market Studies in Lebanon. Um, well, it certainly appears, on the surface at least, as though there's the opportunity for free thought and expression of free ideas. Let's take a look at 3.2. But uh, despite these happy faces. You're, you're suggesting, Lee, that there's been a clamping down on freedom of thought throughout China. W what would you say is the cause of that, Lee? Uh, because the Xi Jinping is, uh, he felt threatened by ideas other than his idea. And, uh, and he's felt threatened for uh, his power, control. Well, let's look at picture 4.4 now, and here you are in a classroom in Shenyang. How do you account for the freedom you have to speak to Chinese students about the ideas of the free market and liberty, individual rights, and uh, limited accountable government? Well, we've been cautioned about being uh, uh, careful about what we say. The, the classroom is, is uh, circled with cameras. Uh, we're under scrutiny m most all the time, and there's probably people in the in the room here who are reporting what we're saying. Um, so we're cautious not to be directly criticizing the Chinese government, uh, but you can talk about free markets and free market ideas uh, um, in general references and with reference to other countries, the United States or elsewhere. And the students are pretty excited about it. They ask lots of good questions, probing questions about. Uh, Markets and and um, but then you also have to be uh, careful about the use of uh, of, of the media. You know, uh, with the great firewall of China, you can't access um, uh, YouTube or Facebook or Gmail. Uh, WeChat is closely scrutinized uh, for what you say. So you have to be extremely careful what you say in those things, or else you get shut down. Lee, I know you know some of our friends in Beijing who formed a think tank many, many years ago. I've had the privilege of being able to address them and work with them a bit and grow in friendship. It was very saddening, disheartening to hear that they've had to actually shut down uh, as a result of this new tightening up on the freedom of speech. Do you think that there are scholars and individuals throughout China who are still trying to carry on the cause of freedom in a big way? Yes. They are. Um, actually, the think tank you mentioned is Uniru. That's my partner. For the past nine years, every time after Northeastern University, I will bring my scholars to Beijing, and we will have uh, two-day events in, in Beijing with the Uniru. 
this year is the only year they couldn't officially um, work with us. But um, many of their members came to this um, our event, and uh, they were just told the, the name, their name. It was registered, now became illegal. From now on, if anybody used this name for any purpose, will be imprisoned. From my understanding, these folks were not very uh, aggressive. They, they were not politically in the face of the government and so forth. For the most part, they did good economics work. They, they published research. They did studies that showed the economic condition of China. They were read by educators, by government, by business. It's just that some of them happened to have free market ideas, belief that uh, individual liberty is something to be cherished and valued. So what is it that they actually did that was wrong? Nothing they did was wrong. All they did was good for the country and the people, but the government, uh, right now, uh, anything challenged the government monopoly in business, in uh, academic, in any uh, field is illegal. So that's how all. And uh, government is uh, afraid of uh, people that um, want to think out of the box and want to question their authority and want to um, um, think in a, in a way different from the uh, communist doctrines. Mm. All of those are now became illegal. Uh, so, they don't care what's good for the country and the people. They only care how they can hold on to their power. Well, you know, Ken, uh, as an economist, you're familiar with some of the luminaries, uh, Hayek and von Mises and uh, Milton Friedman and others. When I see pictures of these folks in China. Uh, I also sometimes see some references to Ken Scullin. <laughs> you, you yourself, for your work and your very famous book, uh, The Adventures of Jonathan Gullible. But how do you account for this fascination that many scholars, free market thinkers, and business people have in China with the free market, or what we call even Aus Austrian economics? I have to admit that uh, this is also due to Lee's connections in China that my book was able to be published twice in, um, in uh, Shanghai and in Beijing and sold out, you know, was very well received and it, it passed the censors. As not not does. counting the bootleg copies on the street. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so, yeah. And it passes the censors because it's uh, written as a story and, and uh, uh, and a lot of people, maybe the censors don't quite get the, the point about the message of freedom, so it gets past them. Um, but there's a lot of fascination with the ideas, and we, we ran across a lot of people in, uh, in China, businessmen, entrepreneurs. We're actually pleased that, uh, that President Trump was doing this, uh, this uh, push on, uh, on Xi Jinping and the government of, of China, because they said, you know, we can't. We can't push back against the government of China. So they, they were sort of applauding the U.S. Uh, uh, government doing it. Uh, of course, from my perspective, I'd rather the governments just on uh, both sides stand back and let the population uh, just do free markets. But um, they're interested in it because it's denied. It's just the, the whole story of human history. When you're denied freedom, people become more intrigued with it, and they seek out ways to find it, even if underground. Well, we're going to take a quick break now and uh, then come back and talk a little bit more about the trip that you took and some of the issues that they hand out, hand out if conversation with people in China. My guests today are Ken and Lee Scullin, who have just some fascinating insights into their recent tour of China. And we'll be back in just a moment with them. I'm Lee Akina on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Don't go away. Aloha. I'm Keisha King, host of At the Crossroads, where we have conversations that are real and relevant. We have spoken with community leaders from right here locally in Hawaii and all around the world. Won't you join us on thinktechhawaii.com or on YouTube on the Think Tech Hawaii channel. Our conversations are real, relevant, and lots of fun. I'll see you at the crossroads. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Melly James, host of Let's Mana Up. Tuesdays, every other Tuesday from 11 to 11.30. 
This show is meant to dive into stories of local product entrepreneurs and how they're growing their companies from right here in Hawaii. I'm so thrilled to have our show kicked off. And so please join us on Tuesdays at 11 o'clock as we talk to local entrepreneurs and hear their stories. Welcome back to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. My guests today are Ken Skoland and Lee Skoland, and we're going to jump right back into our fascinating conversation about what's been going on or what they've observed during their travels to China in their roadshow promoting free markets and economics. Uh, Ken, we've got another show, a photo up here we're going to put up. Uh, people are intensely focused on learning, and it's as if you come. You and Lee come and they just eat out of your, your hands. They're so fascinated. Ideas are powerful and ideas matter. So what are your thoughts about how powerful the ideas of free, the free market can be in changing China? What can people who want to bring about change do? Well, I often uh, I feature as my main point during these lectures about uh, the Economic Freedom of the World Index was produced by the Fraser Institute to show how economic freedom around the world in some 200 countries around the world are evaluated for measures of economic freedom. And in those cases, they have much, much greater success, not only in the amount of wealth that they produce, but education, uh, literacy, health care, environmental protections, uh, uh, all, all sorts of benefits come to countries that have this economic freedom. And so you're talking, when you say economic freedom, you're talking mm -hmm. about having certain qualities like the protection of private property or, or limited government intervention in the economy and, and so forth. Precisely. There's, there's five basic criteria. Uh, a, a limited uh, role of government spending and taxation, uh, a secure property and contract uh, rights to a secure legal system, sound money. Uh, open trade and a minimal amount of uh, regulatory control. And I know in the project you're talking about the economic freedom of the world and its companion project, Economic Freedom of North America, there's more than 30 years of time series data that shows where those qualities are in place to actually reduce poverty, you actually close the gap between the rich and the poor, you actually have human rights, you actually uh, preserve freedom. And, and this isn't just an ideology. It's hardcore data. And, and so I just wanted to mention that for our viewers, that we're not talking here about a theory only. We're talking here about actual research that shows where you have the qualities of economic freedom, you have the quality of life grow tremendously and the quality of freedom. I'm going to go back to you now because you brought that up for a reason. Well, interestingly, in China, there's a vast difference in the amount of economic freedom in the different provinces of China. It's a huge country. And the provinces on the East Coast that are free, free economic zones have some of the freest economies in the world, and some of the other provinces in the west of, of China are the, the least free. And one thing that's made it possible for China to uh, have such prosperity as they've, is unparalleled in human history in, in the last uh, half century was a, the, the movement of people and a mass migration from the western provinces where they were least free to the provinces in the, along the coastline where so much more productivity resulted. So I consider a sixth condition, uh, openness to migration, as being very, very important to economic prosperity. And you're not just talking about immigration and immigration within national borders. You're talking about within the country yeah, the, the, yeah. The, themselves, because China, in many ways, just didn't have free travel uh, available to the masses. In the last and, 40 years, more people moved within China than moved across international borders worldwide. And one of the things going on when they move, of course, is they're obviously voting with their feet. Mm -hmm. They're coming from places that are low in economic freedom, and they're flocking to centers of economic freedom that are now just flourishing. You know, one of which, of course, and I would ask Lee just for a, a quick thoughts. So we're not going to analyze this quite a bit, but everybody knows what's going on in Hong Kong right now in terms mm -hmm. of the conflict between the protesters and the government and the police. You know, it seems as though the Chinese government is so sensitive about what's taking place, they're bending over backward to portray the protesters as rabble-rousers. 
Yes. They, uh, I think, I believe they hire thugs to pretend to be protesters to do the vandal vandalize thing, businesses and beat people up. And so they can use that to, uh, to be excused uh, so they can use uh, military force to crack down the protest. Well, that's something, you know, the, the public relations is power of the Chinese communist government is, is just tremendous. And as a result, you even have people in Hong Kong who are rising up in defense of the government and the police, thinking that the protesters are the ones who are causing the problem. Yes, and uh, one case I know of, uh, one person posted three pictures of the demonstration in Hong Kong because he was, was there on social media, and his phone number was taken away because in China, you have to register, get a phone number with your ID and face rec recognition. So without a phone number, you, you, you can't do much of anything because everything now is uh, with your phone number. So in order to get his phone number back, he has to tie his uh, bank, personal bank account to his phone number. And the promise he's never going to violate any of the government uh, social credit code, uh, otherwise he's a personal bank account will be taken away. Well, that's something that's a real threat to individual liberty. Yes, just real, three pictures real on social media. That's mm -hmm. something. And if you like those pictures, you're another person who likes it, you're yes. in trouble too. Oh, yes. that's something. Mm -hmm. right. You know, Ken, you were talking about economic freedom and the report Economic Freedom of the World. Mm -hmm. It actually ranks Hong Kong as being the number one city state for the practice of economic freedom which explains why so many people have flocked to Hong Kong. Exactly. And, and yet you see this conflict taking place between the old way of thinking in China and Hong Kong's new way of thinking. How, did, how does China reconcile these two dynamics that are at play? There's the old conservative thinking of power and centralization of control in Beijing. And yet there's the vitality in the special economic zones, such as Hong Kong and Shenzhen and, and parts of Shanghai and elsewhere. How do you account for these two different dynamics? Do you think they can exist together, or will one of them win out? That's always a big, big question, you know, because uh, tyrants uh, can't tolerate uh, challenge to their authority, and yet they love the blessings of market prosperity because it gives them a great deal of wealth. I mean, the Chinese government is extraordinarily wealthy and powerful because of what the market uh, has, has brought to them. And, uh, and, and their economy has been on hyperdrive during the last yeah, five years as yeah. a result of these opportunities for economic growth. But let me, let they're, me they're feeling it in jeopardy now, too, because, uh, well, as, as Lee knows, these, these, uh, these powerful figures are, are, are themselves uh, in jeopardy that they're you know they they themselves or their families want to get out with their wealth because they, they're worried about what what can happen to them when it's taken away from them and it can happen to anybody who challenges the government's authority or who even appears to be you know so it's it's a very precarious thing uh, Lee knows a lot of Chinese who are very eager to get away from China get out of China and bring their money and wealth with them and their families you know. they are fleeing yeah, this this is something it, take a look at in Hong Kong that so many Chinese have made their way to Hong Kong mm -hmm. in the hopes of being able to have basic freedoms and economic opportunity. And now there's a clamping down taking place right, right there. So I think the world is watching very, very carefully. Mm -hmm. Now let me just switch subjects for one second. One of the delights I have is whenever I get to go over to your home and taste Lee's cooking. <laughs> I love to cook. Uh, you cook everything. You cook yes. Chinese. You, you cook pizza. <laughs> <laughs> We've had your pizza at, at some of these seminars at your house. I cook Afghanistan food. I cook Turkish food. I, I so, usually learn how to cook from the countries I, I visited. I'm going to put you on the spot here. I'm going to ask Ken, how does the food in Chengdu, we've got an image, number five, to put up. <laughs> how does the food in Chengdu compare to Lee's cooking? Oh, well, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> come on. <laughs> no, uh, Lee uh, is certainly the best cook on the planet. So that earned my, my uh, meal tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. So we're looking here at a group here in the city of Chengdu, known for many things, including its very spicy, spicy flavors. It's one of my favorite foods. What's going on here? Uh, as you can tell, this is not a, 
um, conference hall or meeting room. It's a, a restaurant. And on the wall is the paintings uh, done by mm, the owner of the restaurant. She's the one in black sitting ne next to me. The reason we have our events in restaurants is because we, were, we cannot have it in any official uh, venues or openly publicize it. Uh, this, these all events um, sponsored by individuals, entrepreneurs. Uh, some people pay for our airfare, some people pay for our hotel, some people provide the food and the venue. Only, that's the only way we can have, uh, we had our um, road show besides the uh, Northeastern University. We were invited by the university, but other than that, all the events was held in uh, private uh, places. Uh, and uh, we couldn't uh, advertise it only by personal invitation only, but we have a lot of uh, people uh, in our uh, social group, uh, social circles who are interested in these kind of uh, ideas. Well, we've only got about a minute left, so here's a quick question for you. A phenomenous development, you referred to it briefly before the trade war. Mm. What do you think that's going to ultimately result in? Mm. Oh, by the way, at the Northeastern University, the first lecture uh, mentioned the word trade war, and immediately uh, the school told me, please don't say this sensitive word oh. in our, all, our, all of our lectures. There you go. Rectification yeah. of name. Yeah, I, I fear that uh, the, the harder this trade war brings uh, the life in, in China and the United States, it's, uh, the, the worse it's going to be for countries all around. I don't think, frankly, I'm not a, in, a fan of this uh, tit-for-tat uh, trade battle at all. It only does harm to innocent people, and uh, only the politicians come out as winners in this sort of thing if they can ever come out as winners. So I, I hope that it ends very quickly and we get back to um, more free trade uh, prosperity. But other than that, I, I'm worried because the more hardship there is in these economies, the more hardship the, the governments are going to bring down on the people in the country. It's like an ancient saying in China from the Summa Qian, let water and trade flow freely, thereby the people prosper. Exactly, exactly. exactly. Um, I might mention that uh, when we came back to the United States, that's when Lee was grilled for an hour by the immigration people in here. Where, where, where have you been? And, and so I think that even this country is, is uh, becoming increasingly nervous about people going back and forth uh, in well, other countries. Lee, we're going to have to have both of you back soon. We've come to the end of our program. But thank you for all that you're doing across the world, mm -hmm. in China and here in Hawaii. Thank you for being yeah. on the program, Lee. Aloha. Thank you for and having Ken. us. Thank you, Kali. My two guests today, Ken and Lee Scullin, great freedom fighters and educators traveling the world, spreading the good news of the free markets and the idea that individual liberties are inviolable. I'll be back next time on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. I'm Kili Akin. Aloha.